Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we study your word tonight, we just thank you again for this new week and just this opportunity. Father, we just ask right now for this crisis that's ongoing, you would just really intervene and that you would use this for your glory and honor. As we study your word, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to us. Father, may we see the glory of you, the power of your word to create from nothing, and, and the reality that your lordship is completely sovereign over all of us, and that our job is to trust in you and to, and to obey your commands. Father God, I pray that you give us this revelation and that you would guide the students, encourage them. I pray as the semester is, is coming close to halfway that you would just strengthen and encourage them, help them to keep on the straight and narrow and to just to continue to work hard, Father God. It's in your son's precious name, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin our study for tonight. We have a little less. Perhaps people will come later. Everyone's busy this week, I think, and so no problem because we can just record it. <laughs> it's being recorded, so uh, let's go ahead. So tonight is session number three. We will actually, I am not sure if we will make it to, I shouldn't say I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure we will not be able to do the fall tonight. Well, our focus will be tonight will be on the creation by the word and also the Adamic covenant. So we will really unpack these two ideas as really the first step, the first, uh, the first part of the big story of the Bible. And so we're looking at these two, uh, really one is connected to the other. One is part of the other. They're not two separate. Some people will separate them as two different parts, but really Genesis chapter two is within the context of Genesis chapter one. And it's giving more details surrounding the creation of, of man. So uh, that's my position right now. It could change. There's debate. But um, so regardless, we're looking at this, these, these, the creation as the first major event. All right. So just a quick overview for tonight. What we will be doing is we will first be having a quick introduction to the idea of covenant. So you, you've heard me. We, we looked at the 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 basis the fact that we are part of the new covenant in Christ but we really didn't go into details of what a covenant is uh, we just kind of highlighted the fact that the new covenant we're part of the new covenant and the sacrifice and 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 the, and that, and the covenant uh, the gospel and the covenant are not separate they're they're inter intertwined and so we will be looking as we look at the big story this idea of covenant is actually quite important to the big story. So we're going to be looking at covenant a little more deep tonight, uh, or I should say deeper tonight, because, because we see the covenant with Adam, and God is going to be working through his creation with covenant. So we really have to start to begin to think in, in these categories. Uh, next, we are going to actually, we've asked, uh, we've made observations, but we've also uh, asked questions for the creation event. And so what we will be doing is really unpacking all the significances concerning this, this creation event. Okay. And so I'm entitling it create creation by the word or creation through the word. And so we'll be looking at that. Thirdly, then we'll also then we'll look at the endemic covenant thirdly. So I, I in, 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 in some ways I thought about having the definition after but really the Adamic covenant is present both in the creation event and also with in chapter two. So we have to really define covenant first so that you can be familiar with the concept. And then when you see it, it'll become even more clear. So that that's in a way, that's a re, that's the reason behind me talking about that. Uh, and then lastly, we'll do the homework. Okay. So that's kind of our, that's our blueprint. That's our blueprint for, uh, tonight. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's, so what we'll do is we will look first at some of these, these aspects of covenant, and then we'll get into the text. Okay, so I, in some ways, I just want to set us up to really unpack and understand covenant. So uh, the first area, the first area of study tonight is this idea of 
uh, the definition and description of covenant. So the definition and description of covenant. So maybe you've read this. Maybe you're not so familiar with this term. Okay, sorry. I, I was getting some feedback. So, okay, sorry. My apologies. I wasn't sure if Henry wanted to say something. Okay. Um, uh, maybe you've heard of this term before. Maybe it's new to you. And so uh, I do want to say off the bat that there, there is a, there is a, a big debate in in, in uh, evangelicalism concerning uh, different like frameworks. And, and so maybe you're familiar with, with, with uh, this debate. I am not entering into that debate. Okay. So there's people on different sides. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus on what the text says. We're going to highlight things. And so I'm not, this is not entering into the debate on, uh, on, on like bigger structures theological structure okay so you'll you will see some similar terminology because they're biblical okay but i'm not i'm not entering into those the that debate so i just want to set that as a preface maybe you will have questions and perhaps the conversation will move in that direction but again i want to really focus at what the text says in genesis 1 and 2 but also looking as as it were uh at, at the back of the book so when, when we're when we are when we are uh, doing math problems, you, you're you're supposed to practice the problem in the math book, and then the answer is in the back of the book. Same in engineering. The, I'm sorry, the the answer is in the back of the book, and so the whole purpose is that you're checking your answer. And so, in some ways, using an analogy, we're looking at the text of Genesis. We're look we're considering it in the big picture, and we're looking we're we're we're, <laughs> we're cheating. We're going. We're going ahead and checking and checking uh, the answers, okay? And so, because the, the scripture is full of interpretation, it is giving us significance, the Holy Spirit is giving us significance, and I'm becoming more and more convinced we're fools, and we're, I don't want to say fools in a negative sense, but, we're, but in some ways we're, we're, we're not wise if we don't look at how Jesus, how his apostles, how the prophets understood these events. We are really not, we're not reading the scripture wisely. So we're always looking to see the relationships here. So let's go in. No more, uh, uh, no more delay. All right. So what is a covenant? This idea of covenant, okay? So uh, the first thing I want to say is that if you just word search, so I just, before we, we, before we uh, began tonight, I did a quick word search of covenant in the ESV. And I found 325 times, 325 times, both in Old and New Testament, is this word covenant used in ESV. Now, if you were to do a search in, uh, in the original biblical languages, you would probably find more references. So I did not do that. I just, I just picked ESV just, and just searched covenant just to give you perspective. So there's 66 books in the Bible. There's 325 references, so you can imagine it's used a lot. Okay, so this, so we're talking about covenant. It's not a peripheral issue. It's a central con, uh, a central construct. So anyway, um, uh, 325 times. So it's not a small concept. It's it's a large concept, and so uh, we want to think about that. Now I have a list. What? <laughs> Who is involved in, in this idea of covenant? So who's involved? Uh, we'll see tonight, Adam. There's a covenant with Adam. There is a covenant with Noah. There is a covenant with Abraham. There is a covenant with Isaac. There is a covenant with Jacob. There is a covenant with Israel. Now actually with Jacob, it's both Jacob and also Israel because his name changes, okay? And then there's that covenant with Israel. And actually, there's many reinstitutions of that covenant with Israel over the course of millennia, okay? There is a covenant with David. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is a covenant with night and day. We'll see a reference if we have time tonight. Uh, there's a reference to God ha uh, having a covenant with the night and the day. Uh, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. And then, of course, there's the new covenant, okay? 
And we looked at that, we looked at that uh, last week, okay? And so uh, what we can say is we, I've been highlighting one, one participant in the covenant and now I'm gonna bring in the other. And it, so you have all these different participants uh, and of course there's a covenant with Jesus as well. He's, he is the mediator of the new covenant. I did not mention it, perhaps I should have. Um, uh, but then the other person, the, 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 the one other participant that's unified through all these different covenants is God. And so I do want to say, you know, I did not give references. If you wanted specific references, I could maybe create a handout and post it. What I want to say is that uh, this should not be controversial. This is biblical. God interacts with his creation through covenant. Okay, God interacts with his creation through this idea of covenant, okay? And there's, there's reasons for that, and we'll begin to see uh, what those reasons are tonight, okay? And so in the, looking at the big story of scripture, we need to understand that God interacts through covenant. And so in, in a way, uh, we could say in another sense, we'll tease it out more as we go along, but God enters into relationship through covenant, okay? The way that God interacts, or you could say God relates or enters into a relationship with his creation is through covenant, okay? That should not be controversial. Uh, that's how all, of, through, through, through the scripture, that's how we're all connected to God. Next, so I wanna just give a brief definition. There's different definitions. We could go more technical perhaps throughout the semester. We will develop this definition further. So a, a covenant, just a basic definition is a solemn agreement with, with oaths and or promises which imply certain sanctions or legality. So if, I don't know if Corey Bulboy is in, uh, but here. yeah, here he is. There's, I, I, I hear him. So, so there's that legality is there and, and Corey Bulboy knows covenant. They use, maybe they use, use covenant language in law sometimes, uh, perhaps. Uh, we at least use it in, in religious, especially the covenant of marriage. We didn't even talk about the covenant of marriage. So in our, in our, in our day, we use this idea of covenant with marriage, okay? So I just want to give a, so there's the definition. And then again, I just want to give several descriptive ideas that go along with covenant. These descriptive, these descriptions are not, I did not, I'll just wait for a moment. These descriptions are not uh, comprehensive, but they are helpful so that when you see these descriptions being described, you can understand that behind the description is this concept of covenant. And so a, a parallel analogy could be that you don't have to use the word in order to imply the reality. So I can say, I'm living with a woman. Uh, we are having a relationship. We have a child. We have uh, we we've 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 signed a document down down uh, legally. Uh, we we had a ceremony in the church. I could use at a certain point. You say, "Oh, they're married, right?" You'd say they're in a marriage covenant. Now I don't have to mention marriage. I don't have to say explicitly we're married. I could just say my wife Bethany. And what's presupposed is they're in a marriage relationship. They're in a marriage covenant. Legally, they're in a marriage covenant. So in many ways as well here, um, there are many different ways to be describing this idea of covenant, but you don't have to have the actual word explicit in the context to understand that covenant is occurring, okay? And so here are just some descriptions that, that, that is, again, not comprehensive, but helpful. And as we work through the scripture, you will see these characteristics uh, throughout scripture describing different covenants, okay? So number one, there has to be two parties, okay? So in order to have an agreement, there must be two parties. Uh, there are more than just a covenant between God and man. So there's, for example, Abimelech and Abraham enter into a covenant. Uh, Israel enters into a covenant with, um, I'm going to mess up the name, but, but uh, it is it Gibeon that comes and visits Israel? They say, they say they're from a distant land. And then, you know, their shoes are all worn. It's fake. They're trying to save their own skins. And they enter in that covenant with Israel, okay? So it doesn't have to be between God. It's just uh, 
it could be between between any two parties. Now, they can be equal or there can be a superior and inferior, okay? So they don't, they don't have to be equal. Um, typically, there's a promise. Uh, in almost every instance, you'd have, to, you'd have to give me an example where there, it wasn't the case, but there's always a promise. And there is always at least one obligation. Um, and, and most often, there's obligations from both sides. Um, but they don't have to be. Okay, there has to be at least one obligation from one party to another. Okay, and it, again, it would depend upon uh, it would depend upon whether they're equal or superior. For, again, I'm just giving general, general, uh, general descriptive pattern. Um, typically, there's a warning against failure to keep the covenant. Okay, so there's a warning to 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 the other party, or maybe there's a warning to both parties. It just depends. But there's a, a warning against failure of not keeping the covenant. There is also a, a judgment, either explicit or implicit, uh, to assess if, if one is faithful or to assess, to assess one's faithfulness. Okay, so there's always a judgment. And then, and then there is eventually a, either a reward or punishment. So in describing this, you can, you're, you can just imagine, wow, there's a lot of this in Scripture. And, and the case is, yes, there is. It's all over Scripture. And it, and it describes our salvation as well. And so uh, this is, this is a, a general description. And you can even look in a marriage relationship, right? A marriage relationship is two equals. There's promises. There's obligations, <laughs> right? There's a warning to, keep, to be faithful to the covenant. And maybe not... Now in the U.S., Sayang Talaga, there's what's called no-fault divorce. Uh, we have some, uh, so Sayang for America, Sayang, that we have no-fault divorce now. Um, but before no-fault divorce, there was always a punishment for the one that failed. There was a big, there was a big punishment for the one who broke the covenant and, and, and the, the, the violated party could divorce and then they had to suffer. And, and there was a period of time in the U.S. history where you would go to jail for committing adultery because you broke a legally binding contract. Think about that. Adultery is breaking a legally binding contract. Technically, that's the case. Yes, I got the thumbs up. <laughs> so it's true. We, how far has our society fallen that we don't think, in, like, why would you send them to jail? Well, they entered into a legal agreement and then the one party broke it. And so it really... It's really serious in Sayang. It's become so uh, uh, we 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 really despise this this marriage legal covenant. Okay, um, and legally, how much more in, in in God's in God's judgment in God's eyes? And then of course there is a reward or punishment. And so <laughs> maybe you'd say, I don't have any reward. Okay, fine. There is a reward <laughs> for faithfulness. A happy marriage. It should be. <laughs> So uh, this, is the, this is the description. Let me just take a pause. Any questions or comments? I don't want to rush. Uh, in, uh, in a legal agreement, we call it contract or covenant that's uh, synonymous. Yeah. There is one element in the validity of a contract or agreement, which is consent that is freely given. Uh, why did you not include that as one of the descriptions in a covenant or one of the elements in a covenant? Um, so... I have to think about that. Consent is freely given. I would say because, so, so maybe this is closer to a biblical covenant. So Adam didn't have a choice. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so, so it, 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 it can be, but in, in some instances, consent is not always. <laughs> so when you're, when you're, so in, in the scripture, and also the near, the ancient Near Eastern context. Sometimes the the party is the king who is superior goes to the inferior people and says, "This is the agreement you're going to agree to, or I will destroy you." Like like that. So there isn't consent is always not the case. So, but but great observation, Koya Bull Boy. And in other cases, so Abraham consents, uh, Jesus consents to be the one, the mediator for our covenant. So the consent. Let, let me make a modification. Uh, let me write that down, and maybe I'll make an adjustment for the next class. Uh, it doesn't, it's not required, but it, it could be possible. Let me just write this down. 
Any other comments or questions? See, I'm learning something new tonight. We are, we're all learning something. Uh, Oops, what you describe as uh, when the other party has no choice. There is an equivalent uh, description of a contract in law. We call it adhesive contract. Have okay. you heard of that word? No, not yet. Adhesive contract because you just merely, like an adhesive, you just have to accept it. You cannot, do, you cannot change it. You cannot uh, alter it. It's like an insurance contract. Like an insurance wow. contract. Either you accept the insurance policy or not. Like uh, the agreement when you buy a ticket for an airplane, a boat, or uh, whatever mode of transportation, you cannot alter the terms and conditions in the ticket. Yeah. You can say, oh, why only 100? Uh, only you, cannot, you cannot alter it. That's what you call adhesive contract. No, Maybe so that's, yeah. This is similar to what you are describing, that the other party has no choice. You have yeah, to and, that's, and so like with insurance, you buy insurance with a vehicle, you have to accept that. The, the law requires it. So that's, that's a great example. That's, that's another great example. Yeah, so great. That's, that's good. That's good. Excellent. Anyone else want to add? We're going to go ahead unless someone else wants to add. I'll just look through here really quick. Uh, team. Go, go ahead. Yeah. In God knew, uh, God knew beforehand that man will sin. In spite of that, he made a covenant with man, which is, which Okay, this is just my observation. Which God knew that someday man will fail in that covenant. Yeah. In, but, but he also made a covenant to himself that he will rescue man yeah. when he sinned. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, I don't know, in, he made a covenant with man that he knew man will sin. At the same time, he also made a covenant to himself that he will rescue man. Yeah. And, and that covenant to rescue man was in eternity's past, before the foundation of the world. Yes, so, yes. yes. So, before the foundation. So the, the big takeaway, Kapitan, and, and looking at Pastor, uh, Pastor Henry's observation is that <clears throat> God, number one, is all wise. And then number two, there's some greater purpose. We would think, why would he do that if he was going to fail? But there's some greater purpose that I, I hope that we'll see as we look through the, the big story of the Bible. There, there's a greater purpose that's going on behind the scenes. Because God knew. God knew. Um, great observation, Queen Henry. Anyone else? Then we're going to go ahead. Anyone else want to add or make a comment? Now, I do want to say this, okay? So... I don't, you know, I was, I debated on whether to share this or not, but I felt it necessary to share this just because uh, it's not accepted across the board. So we, we all come from different backgrounds. So perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, this might, you've not heard of this before. Uh, as a caveat, and when I say caveat, this is a qualification. There's no mention to the Adamic or the, the covenant with Adam in Genesis 1 or 2. For all, the, all of you who did the observations and questions, you would not have found this. And so people will say there is no covenant with Adam. That's just a theological construct. It's, it's not biblical. Okay. So because of that, I did want to share two references of scripture that describe the Adamic covenant. Okay. And so, so again, I'm, I'm taking a peek at the back of the book and looking. And so when we, when we investigate when we investigate the word of God, um, uh, we need to be have this answer in the back of our mind because in reality there is a covenant. So, but but because it's debated, I did want to I did want to share this. So, just explicit identification that there is in fact an endemic covenant. Okay, uh, Hosea six seven. If you want to turn there, your Bibles you can. You don't have to. Um, and so the word of God uh, says. But like Adam, they, referring to Israel, transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. And so the comparison is Israel is breaking the covenant like Adam broke the covenant. Okay. And so there, there's a, there's a comparison between two covenants. Okay. So, but like Adam, they, Israel, transgress the covenant well adam also transgressed the covenant uh and there they dealt with me faithlessly now some people would say adam is not adam 
the, the person, it's at him a place, and it's referring to da 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 da. But so it's it's a very hard read. So so biblically, we need to accept the fact that God made a covenant with Abraham. Okay, it's explicit. Here's another example here. Another example. Not as clear, but I think that the highlighting should should bring out at least the clarity. Uh, Isaiah 24, 5 to 6. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws and violated the statutes. They broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and a few men are left. And so the question is, uh, what is this everlasting covenant? Uh, you know, it can't be Israel's covenant, right? Because it's the earth. Uh, Israel's covenant is only with Israel. It's not the whole earth, right? It can't be Abraham's. It can't be David's. It can't be uh, Isaac or Jacob. What other covenant is there? And so some people will say, oh, it's the Noahic covenant. Although the Noahic covenant does not have a, a warning attached to it. Um, and so some people would call it just a covenant of common grace, an unconditional covenant. Um, you know, it's my interpretation that this clearly refers to this endemic covenant that is still in effect. The curse of, is still ongoing. And so what curse is, what is, the, what is the curse from the endemic covenant that reveals to us that uh, this covenant is still in effect? What's the main curse from, the, from Adam's covenant that, te that, share, that tells us it's still in effect? What's the, what's the big curse? Curse the ground. You will go, you will uh, earn by the toil of your uh, strength, and the woman will uh, give birth with pain. The the serpent will be your enmity, etc. What What's the big one, though, boy? There's a There's a big curse that we all we're all afraid of. We're all afraid of. Number one is the death, and the yes. number two is the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Death is number one, and so. Death is still in effect. And so uh, now it doesn't say explicitly Adam, but again, we would have to ask the question, what other covenant that binds all men and all men have broken? And really the only one is the endemic covenant. So th those would be two references. And so I don't want to belabor the point. If you want to ask a question, you can. I'm just merely highlighting the fact that there is this endemic covenant that's being described in Genesis 1 or 2. And and looking at the definition, looking at the description, I, I, I'll, I'll highlight, I'll further highlight, and I think we'll clearly see that there is a covenant in effect. Any questions or comments before we go on? All right, let's go on. So, uh, Tim, yeah. okay, in the book I'm reading here, uh, God's, big, uh, God's Big Picture, it's a yeah. Bible overview. In, in before, before man sin, it was, uh, they say, uh, it says here the pattern of the kingdom. It's a pattern kingdom. Then when when Adam and Eve sin, it's a Paris kingdom. Don't look oh, anyway. <laughs> you're, 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 no, that's good. No, because we're going to discuss that. So save that for this discussion here. We're, we're going to get there. Now that's the word kingdom. It's right. I, I agree. I agree with this idea that there is a kingdom present, and so we're going to identify that. So it's a great observation. You're already going ahead. So let's go ahead. <laughs> So I want last last question. What's the difference between covenant and decree? Uh, so a decree a decree would be within the context of covenant. So we could say decree. Another word for decree could be law. So within a covenant, the stipulations or the requirements that's a that's the law or the decree within the covenant agreement. The stipulations. We will get into that. We'll, we'll look at all these different relationships because even kingdom is related within the covenant. So we'll, we'll get there one day. If not in this class, Sigurado, we will get there. Sigurado. Okay, let's go. Okay, so let's go ahead in our Bibles to back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And uh, I've already read it. I've, uh, I've read it and uh, you've read it several times. So I'm not going to reread because it will take a bit of time to reread. Let's go to, to Genesis chapter one. And let's just, I'm going to, you have your observations and your questions from last week. I have some of them written here. 
I'm using a new, I'm using a new, I'm, I, I'm using a new worksheet. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hide, I'm going to make some of my own observations. And, and maybe if you want to make or repeat some of your observations as well, or if I miss one of your observations that you think is important, we can add. And so we're just going to kind of work through this together. And then, and then we're going to synthesize and, and make some conclusions. Okay. So, so perhaps there are some of the same observations that we made last week. Uh, we're just going to kind of, it, I, I didn't want to just pick up on the, on the page that we had from last week because it's a little bit messy and, um, um, but we can, we can reference, we can reference there. Okay. So, uh, the, the one thing, uh, the, the first thing I want to highlight is this idea of, of, um, God created the heavens and the earth. And so, uh, I, I do really draw, want to draw our attention to this, uh, idea that this action, uh, this is the action you have the actor who is God, and then you have the object. And, and there is significance in this plurality, the heavens, not just heaven, but the heavens. And so uh, this object, we could say, to really, to, really, to really define it, what is heavens and earth? We could say God created the universe. Okay, and, and someone had asked the question about this idea of in the beginning. In the beginning would be, this would include, this would be a time reference. And what's, what's, um, what's being emphasized here as uh, this is a time reference. We could say this is, cre this is creation, or we could say, um, all, all creation. And so looking here, we see that there is this uh, pre-existence of God, or we could say creator, without explanation. We're on a need-to-know basis. And we don't need to know. We we are we we are here. We are here. Okay, we are within this category. All right, and and another big significance is according to according to John, chapter one, one to seventeen. In the beginning was the word and the word was with god the word was god so what we what we we cannot ever miss as christians is the idea that the word is also pre pre-existent so the word is equated with the creator with Without explanation, without source, okay? So anyone who tries to say that the word is still part of, is just a God or just part of the created order, uh, you would have to reject a, 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 a traditional, inspired, authoritative view a high view of scripture because this is just the reality when we look at genesis 1 and john 1 there is no difference okay uh the word is just it's just in the beginning without explanation without without need to explain okay so those are the those are the the big takeaways here and i want to emphasize this there is a radical difference between creator and creation. By definition, you have God and you also have the Word. 
And you also have, according to verse 2, you have the Spirit. That's a little messy, sorry. You have different categories, right? The heavens and the earth. God created. And then according to John 1, you have the word. So in no, in no way is, is God the word or his spirit. They are completely set apart from creation. All right? Is everyone tracking? That is, that is a, a fundamental... Uh, that's how we start the Bible, okay? So we always have to keep that in view. Uh, Satan and those that are trying to deceive and corrupt want to put, they want to confuse the two. They want to, they want to bring God into the creation. Now later, God will step into creation in his son, but fundamentally, the Trinitarian God is not part of the created order. There is, they are not created. Okay. The, the next thing I, I do want to highlight here is that you, you do have, as people mentioned before, I'll just draw attention to this. I'm just going to use a purple because of uh, you have God, you have the Spirit of God, and then you have, you have the Word present in God's speech. Okay, so whenever it says God said, God said, God said, you need to think Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the eternal Son of God is present. The, the, the eternal word is present here, okay? Everyone tracking with me? There was a question at the end from last week. It was a little bit confusing. So um, let's go, let's, let's just look at one parallel passage really quick so that we have, we have clarity on this. If you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter uh, 1, verse 15 to 20. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Now, you'll see this again because we're going to be discussing this throughout, but I just want to highlight. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, okay? And so uh, this would be an example where people would say, oh, no, he's part of creation. He's part of creation, right? But, but watch what it says here. For, for by him... Look at this. All things were created. Look at the location. In heaven and on earth. This is literally almost the same thing. Genesis, Genesis 1, 1, it, it, it's just... Echoing Genesis 1 1, it just it's screaming it. Uh, this is the location here in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible. So you have so it's all things that were created. Well, which things in heaven and on earth? Number two, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, authorities, rulers, and then the, he restates it all things. So all things again, we talked about in heaven and on earth. All things were created, okay, through him and for him. That's God right there. That, that, this is describing God. Again, this is means. This is means. He's the means. The word is the means by which God creates, okay? He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. This is God language. This is, this, these are descriptions of God, okay? So I don't want to belabor this point. What I want to emphasize, though, is that according to Paul, Paul, when he reads Genesis 1, sees Jesus as the word, the means by which God creates all things. Okay, everyone tracking with me here? So coming back to our passage here, big point. This is a major point. Oh, 
okay? That's a major point. In the beginning was the word. Any questions or comments? Or this, this is making sense. Is, is everyone tracking with me how Jesus is present whenever you're looking at the said and the God? We could add here, just to be really clear, God said, we could say, through the word. Let there be light. Everyone tracking? Okay, good. So, so we, see, we see here that, that God is, we, we, can, we can also see here that, that uh, so God is the creator, just to really spell it out. And I think probably you had, you had those observations. That's, that's one major point here. This could be, this could be the second major point. The next thing I want you to see here is that, and God saw that the light was good. How can we describe this? What is God doing here? Obviously, he's seeing, but what's, what's he doing here? What would you say that he's doing here? What's another word? Uh, put it in your own words. What is God doing here? Put yourself in this context of if you create something and then you see that it was good. What are you doing? God was happy because he saw it. Yeah, he so he's the light nobody can see. So, but in the moment before he becomes happy, uh, Henry, you're an engineer, Diva. You're building a building. When you go to the to the job site and you're 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 looking at the building as it's going up. Of course, it's making you happy, but what are you, what are you doing with your workers? What is that type of activity? What do you call that? When you go there, you're the engineer. What do you call that? Observing? Did you say observing? Observing. Yeah, observing. You're observing, and you're also, are you not assessing? Are you not assessing the work? Yeah, assessing, okay. In, in, in the creation, Okay, in the creation, there was chaos. Yeah. There was chaos. The earth, which we some uh, when we say earth, it is the land. But for me, when the original meaning of earth was water. Yeah, because in verse one, uh, verse two, the earth was formed, was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So yep. the earth was water, not land. Yeah, because the land will and, be there. Yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah, according yeah. to the, uh, That's my observation. The earth was not this land. It was water, and it was in chaos. Yeah, so, yeah, so let's... let's uh, we could we could make a further clarification here that this is um we could say this is chaos here we could we could further define what this what this looks like yeah but but coming back to here if god's assessing his work does he not have the right to assess what he does it's his creation right and, and in many ways this here is a, maybe not explicit, but this is an idea to, to, to not only God as creator, but God as uh, Lord, or we could say judge. He has a right to assess the work, and he's the one, Deba, when, you, when you go, this is getting to the root, right? When you're building a building, you know, whatever you're doing, we have uh, uh, Zimone here as well. Um, Right? An engineer assesses the work and you make a judgment. It's good work. It's bad work. We need to fix that. We need to fix this. So, so God in his creative act is also the judge. He's making the assessment and he's assessing that his work is good. It's without mistake. I do want to add this, this further idea of, of number three, God as judge, or you could say, maybe you want to say assessor, whatever you want to say. God is not only creating, but he's, he's assessing 
the work. And, and he has the right to do that. He has not created his creation as an autonomous thing. It's under his lordship. It's under his authority. So everyone's tracking, tracking with me. Any questions or comments? Is that, is that making sense? It shows that our God is a God. Uh, our God is... Is he has he has feelings? Yeah. He, he delights in in he appreciates. He has the heart. It's he, our God. He appreciates. In uh, that's it. He delights and he appreciates. He yeah, in personal. This adds a qualification to the fact we want to emphasize there is no there is no comparison between creator and creation. Okay, there is none. But at the same time, it's not as if the creator God is this impersonal, uncaring, distant being that doesn't care and love and cherish his creation. Okay, so this is a, a clarification to. If we're going to go all the way, oh, he's so far, he's so transcendent beyond us that, that there's, there's no form of emotion within him, okay? All right, so, so it, it does add a, a qualification there, okay? Um, anyone else want to make a comment? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Quick yeah. Uh, when, when God says good, uh, many times in the different uh, period of creation, could we also say that he was making a confirmation of what has been done so far? Yeah, it's a confirmation. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stamp of approval. We could say stamp of approval. It's a confirmation. But the important thing to really highlight is, so we're going to see, we see, so think about for us, think about, People always condemn and attack God. They blame God for all the problems in the world, right? It's God's fault. Um, uh, no doubt in Israel's day, you're looking at God's and, and people are blaming their God. They're saying our God's better, whatever. Um, at the, in the beginning, uh, God, God creates and it's flawless and it emphasizes. And that's going to be contrasted with, because now the world is in, the, the world has gone back to chaos in a sense. It's gone back to, to, to fallenness, uh, the, 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 the perish kingdom or the, the corruptible kingdom, right? And so in many ways, we're, we're seeing a contrast, the work of God versus the work of man. <laughs> what, is, what does man do? Man destroys the creation. He, he, he breaks the covenant. He fails. There is also this contrast that's being set up between what God has done and what man is going to do in chapter three. Okay, so in some ways, that's also this correlation between good and bad, between and the serpent as well. Okay, so yeah, we want, we we can also include this idea of confirmation. Really, it's a stamp. It's a stamp of, con of validation. God's work is perfect. There is no there is no flaw in it. Okay. Great. All right. So then we, we talked about here how, how there's, there's day, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And it's, um, uh, I mean, there's different views on, on, on what the significance is. Um, I would say that's a more advanced, <laughs> a more advanced class. We're kind of going to get stuck in the weeds discussing some, some peripheral issues. I don't want to focus on, on those issues unless you have a question or a comment. Um, I do want to, I do want to highlight the fact that um, uh, the, you have each, just to highlight, you have, just to kind of describe what's going on here. Number one, you have God speaks, uh, creation, uh, for a better term, lack of a better term, pops into existence. God assesses and, and 
the conclusion is good. So that's the pattern for, for every aspect. And then this culminates, this culminates in the The, the, the creation of man. So this is the pattern. God speaks and, and, and things just pop into existence. The, the, the power of the word. Through Jesus, God speaks and it comes into existence. Then God assesses his work and it's very good. It's good. It's perfect. And then the conclusion is, you know, without flaw. And then this is building up until the climax in which he creates man, okay? And this is very important for us because if we have time, we're going to look throughout the rest of, especially in the New Testament, that this creative act, this creative act is a type, it's pointing towards the new creation that he does in our heart. <laughs> so what I want us to be thinking about is, is, Think about this in the area of, of we could say, re-creation or new creation. So if we have time by the end, we're going to go to some places where there's literally God's first creative act is, is being compared to his, his second creation, his new creation. And... And that should give us assurance because when God creates, when God speaks, when, God's, when God shines the light of the gospel in our heart, those who he truly does a work, we would never say he failed in the first creation, but sometimes the new creation it's like, okay, is that really God's work, <laughs> right? So, so this, this has practical application in the life of the church. It has practical application even for us. You know, is, is our desire, is, is it, we're claiming that God has done this work in us. Um, <laughs> we have an example of God doing work, okay? And so that should be a challenge to all of us. And that should bring confidence to us that when we pro proclaim the gospel, we can't change anyone's life. It's the work, it's the supernatural work of God. So I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the point. I just, I'm drawing that, that comparison there and I'm kind of, I'm giving you a teaser. I'm giving you a teaser for the future. Okay. Um, let, let, let's, let's move on here. Okay. Um, now, now I want to focus in on here. Any questions up until verse 26? Does anyone want to add? Do you want to ask a question? Is that making sense? I, I don't want to leave anyone behind. Is it's up to now? Is that? Does anyone want to add? Yeah. Go ahead. There, there are, there are choice of words used by God. Sometimes He uses creation, but when it comes to man, He uses the word, "Let us make man." Is there a significance in the change of uh, the action verb? Um. Uh. There's different words, but we would probably say not so much because so uh, the Greek just uses the word make. The, I think the Hebrew use for the create is bara. And then I think even in making the image, it's also bara. But the make, bara can be make or create. So I, I wouldn't really say that there's a difference. When you're looking at the Greek forms, it's the same. The word can be used to translate make or create. So you just, I would say it's synony there's synonyms, just different synonyms meaning the same thing. To make or to create in our context would be the same thing, right? I can think of in, in, your, in your study of commentaries, did they talk about this difference in the translation to English or? Yeah, no, I, 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 did not, I did not see anything specific on there. I could research that further for you, Koyo Boboy. Um, looking at different, like the original, the Hebrew, the Greek, the New Testament, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the words seem to just be uh, synonyms, just a different word meaning the same thing. 
but I can think about that more. That's a really interesting question. That's a really interesting question. Let me think about that. But I did not, I did not really identify a, a big difference there. Yeah. Anyone else want to add or ask a question? The word, okay. The word created, the word, the meaning of the word, the uh, the, uh, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for created is bara, yeah, to create. Then let us make, make, make man, the word make, it's asa, asa, to make, or to fashion. Yeah. Yeah, so there could be, there could be a, a difference there. I wanted to see something here. So I'm shooting from the hip right now. I'm just shooting from the hip. This is maybe beyond the scope of the class. If, if I'm looking at the Greek word, the Greek, so the Greek, that, that would be Hebrew scholars that translated Hebrew to Greek. They use the same Greek word translating bara, or I think you said asa. You said asa, asa? Asa, asa. Yeah. So they use the same Greek word for bara and asa. So if, if, if there was a different significance, I would expect those, those Hebrew scholars to use two different words. So um, because there are different words as well in, in Greek as well. So I, again, I'm shooting from the hip. Let me think about that. I'll, I'll think about that and get back to you. But yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure there's a big significance there. They're just using a different word that means the same thing. But I could be wrong. I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak. Um, okay, let's move on because we, we'll, we'll take a break in a couple minutes. I do want to. I do want to just just look here. So people have made the observation here that let us make man in our image. This is the actor, and this is a reference to the Trinity. Okay, because of the plural. All right, this is plural. All right. Now, now. Um, people will say, people will say, no, it's not a reference to the Trinity because this is just matching. When you look at God in, in the Hebrew, God, for example, used here, uh, used here. This is, uh, Elohim and this is also plural. Okay. So people will say, no, 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 no. There, there's no significance. It's just matching the plural Elohim, which is plural, okay? But, but the problem is that, uh, is that the verb here is singular. So even though this is plural, even though this is plural, the verb is singular, okay? And the significance then is that why does it change to the plural here? And so what I'm trying to get at is that this, you know, not without controversy, I do believe that there is this, this echo, this implicit truth that the, that it's let us as in the trinitarian god make man in our image again this poor idea our image after our likeness so i do believe that there is great significance here uh, implied in the concept of trinity okay i i do believe that that's present because we've already seen god the father jesus the word and the spirit of God is present. Okay, so so I will, I'll take the stand. Um, uh, now the, the 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 idea Henry brought up this idea of kingdom. Okay, Henry brought up this idea of kingdom here. Right, Henry, you talked about this idea of kingdom, and and that is correct. That that is a great observation because what's what's happening here is that God. The, the created the created world is God's kingdom okay and the way we can be be sure of that the way that we can be sure of that there's a word here there's actually several words does anyone see from verses 26 if you have your Bibles to verse 28? Is there any kingdom language here? So let's look for some kingdom language. Maybe if English is not your first language, maybe it's a little Mahirap, I understand. Um, but do you see any words that would sound like a kingdom? Or, or we could use this idea of kingdom, or maybe in not such a good context, conquer. Is it dominion? Uh -huh. Who said that? Who said that? Me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
So we have this, this action word here, this action word here for kingdom, and literally, now I don't know why, maybe they're matching the King James for have dominion, but it's literally rule. I want to ask a question. Zimon and Ruth, what does your German say? What does your German Bible say? Does it say rule or does it, what's the word used? I think it's rule. Haha, <laughs> that's good. I like that. So German has rule. So I would, I would put in your Bibles, let them rule. Let them rule over, let them rule over what? Over the fish of the sea, over all the birds of the heavens, over all the livestock, over all the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. So this is God's kingdom. And he's setting up, he's extending, he's giving authority. So what's also implied here is this idea of, of the, the lordship, the lordship of a sovereign God, the sovereign creator. He's giving, he's, he's putting man in this place of, of, of authority, okay? What is another word? So we have one here. So this is the first word. Any other kingdom language in here that you see? We have it again here. Any other kingdom language here? This is like uh, in other contexts, the same word is used, uh, oppress. <laughs> Now, it's not being used in, in this negative context. Every word has a range of meaning. But this idea here of sub, sub, oppress or conquer. In what context, uh, what, what do you think? So you have this idea here of rule. You have this, again, rule, conquer. What is this setting up? Uh, is there, why would... Just thinking because everything is good, right? Everything is good. But what is what is coming for your reading from, from Genesis 3, Genesis 2 or G Genesis chapter 3? Why would there be a need to rule or to subdue? And, and what, do you think, what do you think needs to be subdued? Any, any, anyone want to take a guess from the homework? Um, my guess is God is introducing obedience. Loyalty, something like that in that point. Yeah, okay, so there's obedience, loyalty. Yeah, for sure, that, that Adam needs to be obedient, he needs to be loyal. But I guess what I'm thinking about, why is there a need to, to subdue? Uh, Danny, go ahead. Can mean uh, manage uh, or a steward? Y yes, that, that's, there is that component of stewardship, but I'm thinking... Why would God say everything is good, right? Why does he say that man needs to rule and to subdue it? What is that a foreshadow of what? Of what is it? It has something to do with power and power and authority. Okay, yeah, there's power and authority. But so who is going to challenge the power and authority? Who, who is coming soon in the seed? Satan. The serpent. Satan. Sabotage. So there is a reason for this idea of subdue, that there is some, something is going to come that is going to need to be subdued, to, to be crushed. So let's, let's take a break here. Let's think about that. We're probably not going to get to the fall tonight. We'll get to it next week. Tim, can, uh, can I take advantage of the break? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, because maybe, maybe I, will for, I might forget it uh, later when we resume. Uh, notice in the, in the whole seven days of creation, in the whole creation, there is no mention of creation of angels. Is that uh, purposely omitted or was it because there, was, there were already angels even before the creation of the world? So, so, I mean, there's debate. What I would say is that angels are created because, be, but they're not accented. They're not highlighted. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. And so that's the first verse. And then when you look in the New Testament, John 1, 1, all things were created through him and without him was nothing made that was made. Okay. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Um, 
all things were created through him by the word. Okay, so somewhere the angels were created. We don't have those details or the specifics. Uh, and it seems like that's not important. And, and there could be reasons for that, you know, especially in the, in, in the Israel context of highlighting and raising up angels. And so there is, there could be a, an emphasis on the omission, really highlighting the fact that they're not, they're not playing at all into this. It could be, but we don't really know. I, I do want to just bring out one point while people are coming back is that there's a lot more that we can talk about. And, you know, don't think of this, this discussion as comprehensive. Think, think of it as trying to deal with the most important because there's a lot more we could unpack each day, but with a class that we're, tr we're looking at this big, the big picture of the Bible, we just don't have time to go really into the details. I'm trying to highlight the major significances that really orient us. We want to see, number one, how God acts. Uh, what is God's relationship to man? What does God require of man? How does this relate to, to, to the coming of, of the Messiah, Jesus Jesus Christ. So those are, that's kind of the trajectory that we're going. So I really want to emphasize that there's so much more, you know, you could have a whole class on origins in Genesis 1 to 11. I mean, the, the, we can go so deep. So I, I just want to highlight that. Okay, so what I want to highlight now is I want to come back here and just highlight on this idea of the image of God creating creating man in our image and after our likeness, okay? And so I just want to take one minute to look at the image of God, okay? Uh, what does that mean? So what does this idea of image of God mean, okay? So people debate this. There's massive debate, okay? Um, I do think that a, a, a scholar, Wayne Grudem, has a very good... Uh, description here and so i just want to read it to you he says that when we uh when we realize that uh the hebrew word of image and likeness simply inform the original readers that man is like god and he would in many ways represent god so so man is created like god and he's going to represent god okay so then the question can be asked is how is how is man similar to god and so to answer this question of course you could look throughout scripture okay you could look throughout scripture to find the answer but i'll just highlight some of those tonight we don't have time to really go into deep in, in the detail and so the examples that that are given are this number one uh in a moral Moral aspects, right? So specifically, right, the New Testament says, be holy for I am holy, right? Um, we're commanded to be righteous. We're, we're called to be, to be holy, just like God is. Okay, so this could be, we could refer to this as holy or righteous. And so we are called, we are like God in the sense that we have the same expectation, that we are to be holy and righteous in conformity to God's law. Okay. God is perfectly holy. He is perfectly righteous. And so when he creates man in his likeness, he's expecting us to reflect that. Okay. Another idea is spiritual, spiritually there. And so I'm specifically thinking about the, the uh, immaterial, There is a, a physical component, which is not like God, but we also have an immaterial, right? We have the immaterial soul. And so that is analogous because God is a spirit. He's not a physical being. So that would be analogous. We have this spiritual component, okay? Number three, uh, mental concerning uh, reasoning. Knowledge. We're going to see later that we have the ability to reason. We have the ability to, 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 to gain knowledge, to use knowledge. 
And, and the call of mankind was always to trust in the knowledge of God, to trust and depend on the creator. And, and what was wrong with choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that instead of trusting God to follow his way, we're, we're, we're choosing our own way. We're, we're becoming gods ourselves, determining our own right and wrong. Okay, but this idea is that we are created like God in the fact that we can reason. We have intellect, just like God. Now, of course, God is perfect. His reasoning is perfect. He is the all-wise God. In one sense, there's no comparison. But in another way, we're analogous. In some infinitesimal way, we're, ana we're analogous. Um, two other things here is that we are also uh, relational. So he created us relational. There's one God, three persons. They have perfect, intimate union between the three. We were created to, and designed to be in community. Well, the, the closest community, of course, is marriage. And then later, we have the family. And then we also have the church. But this comes back to Henry's, this idea of relationship of a, a personal God, okay, a personal God. And then the last idea here, the last idea here is this idea of there are some physical aspects. And you were going to say, what are you talking about physical? Uh, not that God is physical, but so for example, let's, 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 just, let's just get into the nitty gritty, right? God sees all things, right? He's given us the ability to see. God hears all things. He's given us an ability to hear. God acts. God is all powerful, but we also have an ability to act, right? Even in one sense, he's given us this, we have a creative ability to create, correct? So, so these are the ways in which, now, now again, people can say, no, 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 no. It's just what, you know, fair enough. But I do think that this is the idea of what it means when God says he creates man in his image. And then the other thing, uh, putting this aside, is this, uh, uh, this idea of ruling creation. We are, we are called Man, the first man was called to put in this position of authority to rule over God's creation, underneath God's authority, okay? And that's this idea of be like us and rule for us, okay? Not without responsibility, but there is this uh, lordship, this, this uh, uh, I like what someone's referred to as stewardship, okay? So that's this idea of image of God. Is, any questions? Is everyone tracking with me? Um, I don't want to enter into a lot of debates because the sky's the limit. We just, if you want to make a comment, you can. But I think this is a fair, in, in some sense, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a more comprehensive definition. I think it's fair. Um, uh, any questions or comments? Since the design was for man to be created in the image of God, uh, how come man is weak? Is human nature is weak. We, we can say that man was created good without sin, maybe untested, maybe untested. And maybe that's the, if you want to say, I don't know if I want to use the word weak. I would just say untested. I would want to say untested. Just because we don't, I guess in one sense you could say weak. In one sense you could say, yeah, he was weak. The first test, he, he blows it, okay? Um, fair enough. Be I guess because I don't want to say that God created man weak. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that God created man weak. I want to say that God created man. He gave him the, the, the opportunity, and then man was untested. And for whatever reason, um, at the end of the day, in some sense, I think Man not only was our representative, but also he is our type, meaning every man would have fallen. If all of us, it's not as if, queer bull boy, if God put you there, you would have done it. You would have been that man. You would have made it, right? We all would have failed. I think all of us, I don't think anyone, any one of us would have passed the test. And I think 
there is something profoundly uh, deep that's pointing towards the need of of God to dwell among man. But again, it's it's beyond the realm. That's like a philosophical question that we talked about from last night. It's beyond the the text. Um, I do want to say one other thing before we go on. Um, this is pointing towards Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the, the firstborn of all creation, okay? So, so Colossians 1.15, you can go there if you want. It calls Jesus the image of God, the image of the invisible God. And it also calls him the firstborn of all creation. Looking at it in this context, though, you would not say he's a created being, especially in Colossians we just read that Jesus is not. Paul is saying Jesus is, Jesus is, is the creator. But here, what this is highlighting here, firstborn is highlighting this ruler. It's highlighting kingship. Let us go really quickly to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. I'm, I'm going here because this is where a lot, of, a lot of false doctrine, especially in the Philippines, is highlighted. So I am spending a little bit of time on here so that we really see this relationship. Let's quickly turn to Hebrews 1. Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Look at this. This, is, this comes right back to what we we're talking about. Through whom he created the world. So you, so you see the separation here. There's clearly, there's clearly a separation here. But what I want to highlight is this idea here. The firstborn of all creation. He's the heir of all things. We could say he's the one who is the, going to be the king of all things. Okay, everyone tracking with me? It's not dealing with origin. It's not dealing with origin. It's dealing with kingship. It's dealing with authority, okay? And Jesus is the firstborn, as in he is the son, the son of God, who's going to reign over all things, okay? So I really want to emphasize, I want to stress that point. Okay, so I want to just, I want to end, we're going on to chapter two now. I want to, I just want to highlight several things really quick here, okay? Um, looking here, we can say this here is the, the Adamic uh, commissioning. That's what some people will say, or I want to also describe this as part of the Adamic covenant, okay? He is, he is given, he is commanded to, um, there are some stipulations here. What are the stipulations? Number one, he is to be fruitful and to fill the earth. He is to subdue it. And number three, he is to rule over it. So this is, this, this is the beginning of the stipulations of the Adamic covenant, okay? Um, this is the word of God. This is the first word of God to man, okay? So Adam is, is what's implied here is Adam is to cling to this, he's to trust in this, and he's also to obey it. This could be the prototype of the word of God. You know, you have the creative acts and then you have the commissioning. I mean, this is the first, if you want to talk about commands, this is the first command. All right. These are the first commands. This is the, ultimately the word of God to Adam. All right. Everyone's, everyone's tracking. Okay. Now let's go on to... Um, let me just read something here. So, so one author defined it like this. Let me just read this to you. I don't, I, I forgot to put the PowerPoint. 
So this is what one author describes Genesis 1, big picture. So here's a big picture. If you want to take notes, that's fine. I apologize for not having the PowerPoint. For the whole narrative, a more appropriate theme, so this is big picture, big theme, right, would be with his word, with Jesus, with the word of God, with the son of God, God created the earth as his good kingdom. There's the kingdom that Henry brought up. We can refine this even further still. God is portrayed as the supreme king. He speaks, it is done. So the king speaks, the servants do, right? So it's done. He brings out order from chaos. So again, Henry highlighted the order from chaos. He names the day, the night, the sky, the earth, the seas. Um, uh, so to really go into the, the, the specific theme, we're going to just go really specific. With his powerful word, the king of the universe created the earth as his good kingdom. And if you want to add, he, he placed man as his representative to rule it. So we could say, with his powerful word, the king of the universe created the earth as his good kingdom and placed man as his image bearer in that world to rule it. Okay? I like that. That's a, that's, that, so when we, when we the, 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 the big, that's the big idea. Okay, that's the big idea. Okay, great. Any questions or comments? Does anyone want me to re say that again? Would anyone like me to repeat that? I'll repeat that one more time, just if you missed that. So it is, with his powerful word, the king of the universe created the earth as his good kingdom, and he created man as his image bearer to represent and rule him. I just added represent, sorry. Represent and rule him. Okay, that really encapsulates this idea, okay? All right, let's, let's go on to chapter two. So now we're going to, we've already seen like some of the commands, the stipulations within the endemic covenant. We're gonna get um, my interpretation, my view, if you wanna write this down again, this is my interpretation, there's people debate this, but I really view chapter two as a further expansion on chapter one, 26 to 28. So in chapter two, um, uh, this idea of, let me just come back here. Uh, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so I really see chapter two as an expansion upon the, the Adamic commissioning, the creation, and the blessing. Okay, so if you can imagine here that, if you can imagine here that you have Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 until, is it verse 30? And then this is expanded on in Genesis 2. Everyone tracking with me? It's not, it's not subsequent. It's an expansion. So Genesis 2 is not, if you're looking at chronology, if this is time, Genesis 2 is not here. Okay, it's a further expansion of, of Genesis 1, 26 to 30. Let me just take a minute. Everyone tracking? Does anyone want to ask a question or is that making sense? So Genesis 2 is further expanding upon Genesis 1, 26 to 30. It's debated, fair enough. There's different views. That, that's my understanding and I'm flawed. So take, it, <laughs> take with it what you will, okay? All right, Genesis chapter two. So now we're going to get into the specific, again, we can't discuss everything. There was this whole idea of this idea of the, the spirit creating breath and Adam, we don't have time to go there. I wish we could, but we don't. I want to focus on the, the uh, Adamic covenant, okay? So after God, we could also talk about the institution of the Sabbath and the idea of rest, and we're supposed to be resting. We don't have time to really discuss that, but maybe later we can, we can also discuss that. But that's, that's part of the, the Adamic covenant that's still in effect today. We still need to be taking rest. And I will be the first one to say that I fail. I fall short. My wife is here. She knows it. I, I have sinned. Father, forgive me. I have sinned. I have not always kept Sabbath. Okay. I, I, am, I have repented of my sin and I'm ever trying to do a better job in taking Sabbath. So I, I stand a condemned man. <laughs> 
and maybe perhaps all of us have fallen short of God's Sabbath rest. Those of us who work hard. I know our German friends, they, they take strict Sabbath. So German, our German friends are, they're faithful. We are faithless. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, looking now, we want to unpack Genesis 2.15 to 24, really unpacks this idea of the Adamic covenant, okay? I want to first start out here. One of the, one of the other key I components that really brings out this idea of covenant is this idea here of Lord is a word that describes, number one, uh, God's lordship. But this is his covenantal name. So the Lord God took man. So it's already talking in the language of the covenant, okay? So it's, it's really amazing by design that Diva Elohim is just used in Genesis 1. And then it switches, it switches to the Lord God. This is, the, so just to be really clear, this, this word Yahweh. And what's even more important is that in the history of redemption, Diva, in the history of redemption, Henry, in the history of redemption, it's not until Exodus that, that the Lord reveals the name to, to Moses. Diba. It's not until the it's not until the the um, the Exodus that in the burning bush that God reveals that name to, to, to Moses. But in the in the narrative, uh, he he's described as the Lord God. So this is again covenantal. The narrator is highlighting the fact that God as the covenantal God is covenanting with Adam. Okay, is everyone tracking with me there? So it's, this is quite significant that this name is being used. It's very significant, okay? So God, again, we're looking at action. There's no action yet for man. God takes the man and he puts them in the garden, right? He puts them in the garden of Eden, and then we have a purpose. We have a purpose here. We have two purposes. Number one, to work it, and number two, to keep it. And I, I, <laughs> I am disappointed with this translation. I am disappointed with this translation. The, the word is the Hebrew word shamar. Shamar is a well-known word throughout Hebrew, which means to guard. <laughs> Why is there a need to guard the garden? <laughs> uh, perhaps from, perhaps. But this picks up with this idea again of ruling, subduing, lordship, kingship. right so Adam as king is here now God then the Lord God again so again the Lord God is the actor and now he is going to this is a command right what we can say action action command he commands the man saying this is where, is there consent? Is there consent here? <laughs> no consent. No consent, right? No, it's just a command. So even here, God places man in this position as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a king underneath him. The fact that God is communicating with the man, there's also this idea of, this, this idea of a... Uh, a prophetic function. There's also idea of a prophetic function because God is communicating. Whatever God is communicating, because man has the duty, the duty then to communicate God's word to his wife. So that was a question we asked. Someone asked that question last week. God doesn't command the wife. 
There's in, in, in the story, there's no command to the wife. Adam's job is to proclaim the word of God to his wife. Okay, so there's this prophetic function. And then we can also see there's also this priestly function in the sense of mediation. Mediation. Man is placed in a position of declaring God's word in mediating, handling God's affairs. He is the mediator. And then also the kingly duty in the sense that he is representing God to rule and to protect. So this here is the prototype for Jesus of Jesus one day will be our prophet, priest, and king. Now, of course, there is no sin yet, so there's no priestly function of, of, of atoning for sin, but there is the priestly function is the priest was the representative between God and the people of Israel, okay? Adam is the representative between God and, and creation, or God and, and uh, his wife, or mankind, okay? He's the representative. We'll see that later in the New Testament, okay? So we have then, we have here, we have a command here, right? There's a, there's a command, number one, and this includes the tree of life. This includes the tree of life. And then there's a, there's a prohibition. And then there's a warning. And this is, of course, uh, a punishment for failure to obey. So we have, we have stipulations, right? Stip stipulations we have we have two we have two participants we have the promise of of uh this is also life by eating adam lives right so he has to eat to live so so here there is there is this idea of of blessing and life right there's an idea of blessing and life and there's also this prohibition, there's, and it's binding, right? So we would say, is there an Adamic covenant, yes or no? <laughs> we should say yes. And of course, later the Bible confirms that. So we can clearly say yes. I want to say one other thing here. I kind of missed it here. This idea of lordship contains three things that we should always be thinking about. There's control. Authority, we could say control or power, authority and presence. The Lord has authority. He puts man in authority. The Lord is all powerful. He creates everything. He creates the garden. Man does nothing. So you have the control. You have the power of God. You have the authority. Because you have the authority, he can dictate, and then you have the presence. God is present with man. God is dwelling with man. Okay, so this, this is all the prototype for what is to follow. Man botches it. He fails miserably. But yet there is still this coming back to the garden. God is forever pursuing the return to the garden. This is how the story begins, okay? Um, the Lord God sees one mistake. So this is why this is why I'm saying chapter 2 is an expansion from chapter 1, right? It is not good. <laughs> so we have the one statement of, of it is not good, but it's fine because it's still within the context of everything was very good because God has not yet finish his creative work. He has not yet finished created, uh, his creative work. And so here we see that he creates the helper, right? The, the help, helper, as he, as he sleeps, God creates the woman and brings it to the man. And the man says, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. So this is the creation of the woman here. 
And then look at this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this answers the question from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. I think Koya Boboy asked the question. In the image of God, he created man. Male and female, he created them. I'm always, I always mess that up. Let me read that again. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, singular. Male and female, plural. He created them. A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, but they shall be one flesh. And we see here nakedness but no shame. And this is good. Nakedness but no shame. So that's the big story. We have creation by the word. And then we have the Adamic covenant. Now, what I want to ask the question, let's go back. We've looked at how Jesus is present in the creative act of Genesis chapter 1. We looked at how the image of God is pointing towards Jesus being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, that this, this dominion is going to be eventually fulfilled in, is going to be fulfilled in, uh, in, uh, um, in his his in his authority in in the in his authority right the, uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth therefore go and make disciples of all nations he has been lifted exalted above every name that shall be named and uh, what I want to see here is now let's look at some other let's look at so we have the we have all the different contexts we have Genesis one we have the image of God we have the Adamic covenant let's look now types. So I, I don't want to be specific. I want to look at everything. What are some, you had some other reading. Uh, maybe I'll just highlight some things, but what are some, what are some types in this account that are pointing to big ideas in the New Testament? So I'll just give some, if you want to bring some other ideas in, you can. We're, we not, we're not going to have a lot of time. The, the first thing, I'm not going to go here again, but the first thing that I, 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 we highlighted was that image of God points to the exalted Christ. Right? So we have here this Colossians, we've already written Colossians 1, 15 to 20. We have Ephesians. Ephesians 1 I think pa uh, Pastor Henry brought this up before. It was Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. We also have 4, 23 to 24. I would encourage you to look, the look up these in your own time. They're very interesting. Um, and then also Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, which we've already gone to. So in looking at the creative event and the image of God, we should be thinking about Christ, New Testament. He is the true image of God. Okay, that's the first big type that we want to be looking forward to. Okay, um, number two, number two, and I, I alluded to this God's first creative act points towards. His new creative act. Let's go to some passages of Scripture. So we looked at this passage before. I really want to just come back and highlight this. Look at this. For God who said, light, light shine out of darkness. So this is first creation. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, look at this, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Was the first creation phenomenal? Yes. Can we, 
I would challenge anyone, go try outside and look at the sun. Just stare at the sun. You cannot do it. That's God's first creative act. But the most amazing thing is that, and maybe this shows how deep our sin is, how, how dark man's flesh is. The greater creative act is God shining in our hearts. <laughs> the greater creative act of the creator is God shining in our hearts to give us the glory the knowledge of the glory of God. We went that other way. We chose the, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, and yet God is coming back and saying, you chose that other path, mankind? No problem. I'm going to give you my glory in your heart. <laughs> the knowledge. The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's continue on here. Let's go to chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 5 in verse 16 and 17. So again, we have this creative creation of light is picturing the greater light of the gospel in our heart. Greater. That's a greater act. I know you might say, I, I'm not sure it's in. It is. It's the greater act. Uh, verse 16. From now on, therefore, let no one regard according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. The new has come. New creation. The, 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 creator, the creator in the, of the first creation is creating again. It is good. <laughs> it is very good. It is very good. Uh, one more passage of scripture I want to go to. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go now to Ephesians. Very famous passage. Perhaps you have not seen this in the past. Very famous passage. But look at what it says. Let's begin in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his, uh, literally in the Greek, we are his creation or workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his creation. We are created in Christ Jesus. So the image of God, we are now being created anew in him. So, so, the, so the second thing I want us to see is that, is that God's first creative act points towards his new creative act, and we're going to see that. Okay, and so just really quick, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 7, 5, 16 to 17, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Now, I don't have time to go to the rest. I am going to go to one more. I am going to go to one more. The idea of the marriage. So what does the marriage the, the, the union between man and woman really signify. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 25, okay? So we'll end on this point, and uh, there's other passages I might, I might add. I might just do a handout. But so this other idea of marriage, this is why marriage is so foundational. This is why marriage... People, uh, Satan is trying to destroy the image of marriage because of what it points to. Watch this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So there's a comparison. Husbands are to love the wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So coming back to this idea of image of God, that, that we are to be holy, we are to be righteous. This is part of the idea of image of God. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, because they're one flesh. Love their wives as their own bodies, and we all fail. I fail, I fail many times. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So there's husband and wife, one flesh. Christ and the church, one body, one flesh. We, we refer to this as union with Christ. What's true of Christ is true of the church. Uh, because we are members of his body, as it is written, I'm, I'm adding that, therefore shall man leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound. What? Marriage? No. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. And so what I want us to think about as we're closing tonight is that in God's first creative act, he created his kingdom. He placed man as a representative of him in his image. Okay? And he made a covenant with, he entered into, think of, he entered into relationship with man. He entered into covenant with man. He gave him, this is what I need you to do. This is what you must do, okay? And in that covenant, in that relationship, in that creation, he has created this beautiful picture of marriage between man and woman. And that's, that's pointing towards the greater reality of Christ and the church. And so I want us to be, these are the big ideas the big story of the Bible. This is what God has done. So let's go ahead and let's just, let's just end this PowerPoint. I'm a little bit over. I apologize. Conclusion. So I'm just going to make some conclusions here. Um, number one, the Trinity is present in the creation act. We have to identify that. Number two, God speaks. It is created. It is perfect. It is good. God creates through the word his son. God is also judge assessing his work. He enters into covenant with man. He enters into relationship with man, but it's not a willy-nilly man can do whatever he wants. Man is still accountable to the creator. God creates man and is in relationship with man. He is in covenant. Always think of Lord, the Lord God, authority, power control, and presence. God is dwelling with man. God is present with man. He dwells in the garden. We will see that later next week. God places him in a position of stewardship and lordship over his kingdom. Big point here. Adam is to trust in the word that he's been given and to obey God's command. The word of God is very specific. And Adam's job is to trust and to believe. Ultimately, the fall of man we're going to see is a lack of belief and a lack of trust. There is doubt. You see, it in, in, you, you see the doubt. You'll see the doubt in, in Eve's response, the, the skepticism, the lack of, of carefulness in repeating the word of God. And you see the doubt in the passivity of Adam. He's present and he just swallows his tongue while the serpent just runs all over them. God makes a covenant with Adam. He has given a, him a stewardship over his creation to take care of it to guard it, and also to obey and trust God's will and command. He has offered life for obedience. Eat of any tree of the garden. He's offered life. He is warned of death for disobedience. And he's given the command to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And lastly, God creates man in community with the woman, complementary. The same value, different function. They're one flesh. It's not two fleshes. It's not a subordinate flesh. The woman is subordinate. No, they are one flesh created in community with each other, reflecting the image of God. And I want you to see this here. Adam is prophet, priest, and king. He is the proto-Adam, the first Adam. And we don't have time to go there, but Paul speaks of, uh, I think Kaya also brought that up. Adam's the first Adam, Christ is the last Adam. And so here, in a prototype, Adam is prophet, priest, and king. Mediator, he's to proclaim the word of God to his wife, to mankind. 
He is a mediator between God and mankind and the creation. He's also king. He's to rule. He's to subdue. He's to guard. Really quick, the types, and we'll be done here. This is a lot of information. So what I'll do is I'll just post this PowerPoint. So you don't have to write. If you're trying to write, boy, 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 I'll email you the PowerPoint. Okay, I'll email you the PowerPoint. So we, let me just read this through so we can be finished. I don't, I want to rush here. I'm sorry. Uh, man is in the image of God is a type to which he points towards Christ, the anti-type. Christ is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, as in king, heir of all things. I want to stress that. That is what we need to see when we see uh, this, what the creation is pointing towards. God's creation is the type of his, creative, his greater creative work in new creation and in us. We don't have time to go in here, but in Hebrews, this world, this creation is passing away. The eternal is remaining. The eternal is uh, Hebrews 2. He has made him the king. He has subjected the world that is to come, <laughs> the world that is to come to Christ. Okay, so I know that you might say, I, you know, I think this other world is bigger. No, no, no. You need to understand this. The spiritual creation the new creation, the, the eternal the eternal that's coming into the present, that is what is remained. This old creation is fading away. Man's union with his wife is a type of the greater reality of Christ's relationship with the church. And then lastly here, we're finishing. Adam's commission points towards Christ's lordship over all things, especially the world that is to come. I mentioned that already. And then the two Adams. Uh, Adam becoming a living being. We didn't really discuss this, maybe for another time. Adam becoming a living being is a type pointing towards the Christ, a life-giving spirit. <laughs> so I'm just really quoting Paul at this point. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 49. We don't have time to go there. And then lastly, uh, we don't have time to discuss this either, but uh, God, in, 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 through the prophet Jeremiah, talks about how God's made a covenant with the night and day. And if he can break the covenant with the night and day, he'll break the covenant with David's offspring, pointing towards the eternal kingdom. But the big takeaway is that God is in covenant. That might be odd for us, but again, God always at, is in relationship through covenant. Okay, and so God is in covenant with the night and the day. And if he can break that covenant, then the, the covenant with David can be broken. If you cannot break the covenant, the agreement that God has with the night and the day always there's always night, there's always day, then, then David's covenant cannot be broken. But again, I, I guess the big takeaway is that the creation event, the Adamic covenant, these are all the, this is how God acts. This is how God operates. This is how he has created his world. And, and we're going to see him, even though man disobeys and, and, and Satan brings in curse and, and, and sin and corruption, God is still working the same way he has yesterday, today, forever. And he's going to be slowly bringing back, restoring all things. This is the setup, though. This is the setup. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for tonight. And I thank you for your word. And I, I just want to praise you for your creative act. You are the creator of all things. You, you simply speak and things come into existence. Father, you've spoken in our hearts. You, you've, you've, you've created the light of the gospel, the knowledge of the glory of Christ in our hearts, Father God. And we just praise you. We glorify you for it. And as we look at your creative act, as we look at your covenant relationship with Adam, we, we, we see uh, your desire and your will, that, you, that your will and desire in creation is to enjoy your creation to to dwell with us to be in relationship with us to, to to put us in a special position that we don't deserve and yet father god we're going to see how that that we as a, as a, a person in adam we as a race have fallen and yet father god we just uh, thank you for your love and your commitment to your covenant even though we have been faithless even though we have failed you remain faithful to us. You remain faithful to your covenant. And so, Father God, I just thank you so much for what you've done. Uh, help us never, to, never to, to forget your call that goes out every day to trust in your word, 
and to obey your law. And we have this assurance because we are in union with your son, the last Adam. Father God, I just pray now as we continue this class that we would just have eyes to see, ears to hear. May your gospel be proclaimed. May, may we use these truths, not just for our own knowledge, but that our, our hearts would be changed and that we would live different lives and that people would see our good works and glorify um, you uh, who is in heaven. And lastly, Father God, in, in having a better understanding of this big story, Father, may we also proclaim these truths to those around us. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.